Okay, good afternoon everyone and um, welcome to tonight's technical meeting by AACE International Australian Section. Uh, my name is Fran Vera and I'll be your host for tonight. And it's very wonderful for us to have attendees from all over Australia and from many other countries as well. Uh, today's webinar is focused on schedule risk analysis practices during bid phase. We'll discuss one case study, a new soccer stadium. Before we get in started, I would like to introduce our current president, Paul Harris. He will, he will go through some slides to show us a little bit more about uh, AACE, Australian section, and he will introduce us our speaker tonight. Um, okay, so this is a technical meeting, 27th of August, 2020. Um, first of all, the agenda, we'll talk about meeting procedures, an introduction to AAC International and AAC Australian section. And then we have a webinar on schedule risk assessment during bid phase with a case study on a new soccer stadium. We have a little survey, final questions of the speaker, and then right at the end, we'll have an open mic session. If anybody wants to talk to anybody, you're more than welcome to. So the procedures, uh, all the attendees will be muted during the presentations. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to interact at key points in the presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question, please use the, uh, the Zoom chat feature and uh, type in your question. And then when uh, we have a pause, Frank will read the question out and Alberto will, will answer it. We hope to make this webinar available on YouTube after the session. And if you wish to have a certificate of attendance, please email the secretary and Karen should be able to organize one for you. So AACE is the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering based in the US and has been serving total cost management com community since 1956. They're committed to constructive exchange of ideas between members, which is what we're trying to achieve here. The development of technical guidance and quality education, recognition of subject matter experts. So the Australian section has been running for quite some time, but uh, was reformed a couple of years ago uh, when it split from Engineers Australia and Australian Cost Injury Society. Currently, Karen is the secretary in WA. We have Lou, who's vice chair and Queensland regional chair. Alberto, who's presenting is the New South Wales region chair. Uh, I'm the president, as it is a treasurer. Russell is looking after training and development. Uh, Raf is the Victorian Region Chair and looking after sponsorship and alliances. Cameron's doing the website, social media. Membership etc. is uh, Islam and events coordinator who introduced us today is Frank. So that's how we're looking at the moment. Maybe it's a bit uh, overloaded with Victorians. So the contact information, if you need it, is here. So the AACI website is here and general information, you can write to them. And then this is the Australian section. We got our website up and running a couple of, couple of months ago. So I'd like to welcome Alberto Sanchez to present schedule risk assessment during the bid phase. And he'll also have a case study in a new soccer stadium. A little bit about Alberto, he's got lots of qualifications here. Uh, very experienced gentleman, and he's had 25 years experience in planning project controls on a number of infrastructure, oil and gas, chemical, utility sections, and he's been involved in major capital projects around the world in Asia, Pacific, Middle East, Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, both public and private sector. He's a civil engineer. He's got a master's degree in logistics and operations in energy studies from University of Wollongong and Murdoch University in Australia. He's spoken and written extensively on topics of decision and risk management, front end planning, project assurance, modular construction in international conferences and universities. He's currently group head of planning of a multinational construction company and New South Wales ACT subcommittee chair of AAC Australian section. So I would like to welcome Alberto and hand over to him uh, doing his presentation here. And so I will sign off and hand over to Alberto. 
Thank you, Paul. So just give me a second just to bring the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Paul, for the introduction and thank you everybody for attending another ASCE webinar. So just just great. Today we have people from different places. So I think we have people from Australia, from New Zealand, from Egypt, from people in the Middle East, Europe and South Africa. So that, that's great. Um, so let's talk about, you know, what is going to be our webinar today. So it's, it's two things that I'm very passionate about it. So risk analysis and soccer. So it couldn't be better for me. Um, so we're going to talk about why scheduled risk analysis and uh, what is scheduled risk analysis when it's used, um, deterministics versus risk adjusted schedule. Um, and then we will go through all the process with a with case study. Um, I'm very conscious about the times and unfortunately we may not have time to go in details through some of the areas. Um, but if you have any questions, you can use the chat or, or you can just um, email uh, our ASCE or you can email me if you have um, any, any question about the presentation. So, um, so let's, let's go to why schedule is risk analysis. So um, I think everybody working in the construction industry, you know, it doesn't matter if you, if you work in infrastructure, or if you work in utilities or in energy, um, recognize that this is a risky business. Um, we have safety risk, we have weather, we have design risk, constructability, supply chain risk. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, we, we can see historically, you know, a lot of the projects that they are in, in, the, in the industry have experienced significant delays. Um, and, and, and what we see sometimes is that they, they go back to poor planning and, and risk assessment. So we, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to be over optimistic, you know, with, with the delivery of the project. And, and sometimes we rush to, to move the project to the next gate. And, and then what happens is we're not with projects with unrealistic you know, um, schedules and then we know with projects that they deliver late. Um, fortunately, um, there is a growing practice now with more contractors and, and also with, with project owners to, to actually assess the risk of the project. So, so they start to test, you know, whether the, the baseline that they have or the business case or the bid schedule that they have is, is, is actually, you know, achievable or not. Um, a, a little bit of a statistics, so and let's have a look at this information from the ACE about major capital projects that have been completed in the last few years. So and, so, and you see that, you know, 60% of the projects actually achieve the target cost. And then when you go to time and, and, and cost, you go to 40%. And then, you know, when you go to, you know, overall project target, including, you know, the operability, you just go to, to 30%. So just, just actually quite scary when you see something like this. So, um, so what we can do, so, um, so let, let's be honest, you know, it, it's very unrealistic to expect 100% accuracy in our baseline schedule. So, for, so that's the reason why, you know, we need to have, you know, some kind of tolerance in, in, our, in our project schedules. And by using this tolerance, the team is, is giving some room to maneuver um, in terms of achieving the target. So the, the aim is to improve the predictability, predictability and the performance of our projects. So what we can see is the scheduled risk analysis is just, just a simple, you know, an effective method. So we we're doing is just that we connect uncertainties, we connect risk, we connect opportunities to, to the bid schedule. And then it, it actually allows um, the, the, the contractor just to, to answer questions like, um, you know, what is the probability for us to meet the, the contract date? What is the, the probability that we can meet, you know, some of the, you know, the, the key milestones or project milestones? Um, what, which risk had the biggest contribution to potential delays? And what is the best case? What is the most likely? What is the, the worst case? And, and for me, that's all information that if you are, you know, part of an organization, you would like your project team to, to be able to answer. So, so then if, if we continue with, you know, what is the schedule of risk analysis? I, I see the schedule of risk analysis just as a, as a key step in, in the process to achieve a, a robust schedule. Um, so we, we, we start with a schedule review 
Um, so we need to understand, you know, whether the, the, the quality and the completeness of the schedule, you know, is, is correct. So um, um, there is a lot of, you know, recommended practice from the ACE, that is the baseline schedule review, where, where you can see, you know, whether we capture all the activities, the sequence, resources, and it's, and it's basically a pretty good, uh, I would say, checklist to see uh, whether they, 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 they should have the, 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 the correct, you know, um, quality just to, to move into the next step, which is the, the schedule risk analysis. So, so then, you know, the schedule risk analysis is really just to assess how the project risk and uncertainties could impact, you know, the, the, the big schedule. So again, you know, you have some recommended practice for the schedule risk modeling that it can give you a lot of details. And, and then, you know, when you're doing your risk analysis, the next one is just to do a little bit of benchmark. So just to assess, you know, and to validate the schedule using historical data, whether it's internal, whether it's external, or, or if, you know, sometimes you, you work for, you know, you are the owner and what you want is just somebody to do an independent validation of your, your, your schedule before you move to the next gate. So, and to, do we have a, any questions so far? Um, not at the moment, Alberto. I think okay. we can keep going. Okay, good. So let's move on. So, uh, so then, when, when is used? So when, when, when we use, you know, the, the schedule risk analysis. So you, you use the um, SRA um, at different stages of the project. Um, our session today is mainly for the bid, for the bid phase. So we're doing this on the assumption that sufficient risk assessment has been complete to sanction the project before we move to the next phase, to the bid phase and the delivery phase. Um, but, you know, SRA practice is, is extremely important during the pre-project planning phase. So when the project owner or the investor, you know, need to decide whether the business case is strong enough to move to, to the next phase. So again, you know, our webinar today is going to be based on, you know, what we're doing during the bid phase to see whether we, we, we have a, a good chance to achieve the contract date and, and assess how the risk may influence the, the project economics as a contractor. So, um, so before we, we talk too much about SRA, I think that we need to understand the difference between what is a deterministic schedule and then a risk adjusted schedule. Um, the difference is basically that, you know, when you have a deterministic schedule, is just use single value for activity duration. So we say this activity is say 20 days or 40 days. Uh, it predicts a single completion date. So we say we're going to finish the project, you know, end of 2020. Um, but if we have any risk and it just impact a hundred percent likelihood, so we say, look, you know, it's 20 days, but you know, I think you know it could be some impact because you know, you know, late delivery of materials. So we just actually say, well, we're going to increase the lead time, you know, for one of the activities. So the, the, the impact is going to be 100% likelihood. It, it doesn't take uncertainty into account. And, and it's a manual estimation of the contingency or delay allowance. So we say, well, we're going to put something on the back of the program, or we just build a contingency in the program. And, and every activity must happen exactly as planned. So um, on the other hand, we have a, a risk and just schedule where we, we, we use um, multiple duration. So we, we have a, what is the minimum duration, what is the most likely, what is the maximum duration. Uh, it quantify the probability to complete the key project dates. So, so it is actually tell you, well, what, what is the chance that we can meet one of the key milestones? What is the chance that we meet one of the payment milestones? And it take uncertainties into account and quantify the result. And we will see this, you know, through the case study. Um, then we give a predictable uh, estimate of contingency. So we say, well, what do we want? So we want to have a 70% chance or 75% or P90. So we will talk about this, you know, through, through the case study again. And, and activities happen in a range of durations. So it's, it's not a single point. So, um, so let, let's go to what, what is the, the, the scheduled risk analysis process. So I, I try to summarize this in this graph. So what we're doing, we have a baseline schedule. Um, we're doing a, a schedule quality check. And we say that we're happy with it, with the baseline. And, and then we, we go to do our SRA. So we have the input with the duration uncertainties. We have weather risk. And we have what is called the discrete project risk. 
And we put all this in the mixer and we have a scheduled race model that it gives you an output. So what is the output? The output is really just to tell you, well, you know, what is the best case? What is the most likely? What is the worst case? And, and it tells you what are the race drivers. And, and if, we, if we think that, you know, we, we're not happy with, you know, with the result, and uh, we just go and review what we need to do with the rest that we have. And we just come back again and redrawn the, the, the race model. Um, until we get to the point that we say, look, I think that we address all the risk. There is nothing more that we can do. And then we need to select, you know, what is the, the P date or the probability date that we want to include in our, in our bid. And then we just produce, you know, the, the, the bid schedule that we include in our proposal. But let, let, let's go in, you know, in more detail through the case study. So th this is a case study for, um, for a project that I was involved, you know, some time ago. Um, so this is for a soccer stadium. So, you know, we were bidding for this project. Um, it was back in 2016. So a soccer club um, announced that they need to replace the, the existing stadium with a new one. They need a, a bigger stadium. Um, the team moved from the lower division of the league um, and, the, and the existing stadium didn't meet the standard for international games. And, and they were looking just to increase the revenues and they couldn't increase the revenue because they have a constraint with the capacity of the stadium. So the, the club and the sponsor um, decide just to go ahead. They sanction the project and they require the new stadium to be completed before the mid-season in January 2020. And, and they say, well, you know, we, we need to be able to host the, the, the final uh, match for the inter-club club. Um, the main risk that, that we have in the project was the, the, the disruption of the existing tenants, business and residents. It was, a, it was um, you know, an area with, um, with a lot of um, stakeholders. Uh, it was a limited access to transport the, 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 the prefabricated elements, especially for the roof. And we have a contamination risk. We have a complete design and installation of the retractable roof. Uh, the construction period, um, it, it was actually in parallel with some major road work near the site, so just having some issues with, with the logistics. And, and we have significant, you know, liquid damage, you know, as you can imagine, you know, when, when you have a, you know, you have a, a, a stadium that you're expecting to, to, to sell, you know, all the, you know, all the, all the matches with a lot of sponsors, so, you know, so they, they, they actually expect this to be open on time. Um, the, the bid strategy, the management requested the bid team to assess the probability to meet the, the contractual date, so which risk had the biggest contribution to potential delays. Uh, they want to know the best case, the worst case, and, and then what is the proper amount of contingency that we need to put in the program. So based on that, so um, we just start with, with the process. Um, so the first step was the schedule quality check. So before we talk about schedule quality check, I think it is important that we, we make a, you know, we differentiate what is planning review from schedule review. Um, and, and we will explain this, you know, through, through the webinar. So when, when, we, when we go to this first step, um, so we, the first thing we did was the planning review. So the planning review was really just for the B team to, to review um, whether the baseline schedule reflect the entire project scope. So, um, so we need to be sure that, you know, the project scope is complete, the sequence of work, you know, makes sense. We look at the constructability, we look at the project stages, uh, we look at their, whether they are realistic duration, how we came up to the duration, how we talk to the subcontractors, how we look at productivity rates, and, and we just look at the overall project strategy, procurement strategy, design strategy. So, and, and we're just trying to look at this even before we just move to review the schedule. Um, again, I, I just recommend you guys to have a look at this ASCE recommended practice. That is the, the original baseline schedule review. You have really good information about, you know, what you need to do to, to ensure that you have, you know, a pretty good, you know, um, baseline schedule. So then after that, you know, we, we, this is the summary schedule, so that, that's not the full, you know, project schedule, and this is without contingency. Um, and then what we did, we, we just went through the, the, the schedule quality review. So um, 
you know, what we did here is just to ensure that we had the minimum requirement uh, regarding the schedule quality. Um, company had different tools to do that. Some, some, some companies use internal metrics or checklists, um, or, or, or you can use, you know, more sophisticated tools, you know, like a, like a, you know, Fuse or Oracle Cloud, which are based on in industry metrics like, a, you know, DCM14 or NASA Health Checks. Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to say which one is the best one, but um, I think it's also a little bit of common sense sometimes when you're doing a schedule quality review that you need to be sure that you're not missing logic or you have open ends or, or you have, you know, you know, activities with very large floats or, or you have negative float. Um, so after we, we complete this, we say we're happy with the planning strategy, we're happy with, with the schedule, and then we say, well, then we move to the next step, and the next step is basically just to, to review the, the duration uncertainty that we have in the, in, in the, in the schedule. So when, when we look at the duration uncertainties, let me just go here, okay. Um, the, I, I think that one of the most difficult tasks for people working in planning is just to, to agree on the, on the duration that you get to put in the, in the, in the schedule and, you know, deciding, you know, what is the, what is the right duration for the activities is, is not easy. You know, um, uh, some people may have a, an optimistic view of the, of the work and, and then you have others that may have a more pessimistic view. Um, so, and, and I think that, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of doing an SRA is that, you know, you can use duration ranges instead of using a single value for activity duration. So you give an opportunity to people in the project team to assess, well, what, what is the potential impact, you know, in the schedule if, if, if we have, you know, duration of 10 days instead of, you know, 15 days or, or the duration is now 20 days. Um, so um, what we need to understand is multiple factors can, can impact the duration of the activities. Uh, so what we're doing with the, with, the, with the duration or uncertainty analysis is just, well, what, what, is the, what is the potential impact in the program if, if we have a different productivity rate from the, the one that we adopt in the baseline schedule? So what if we say that, you know, the, the productivity rate is, is lower or the productivity rate is higher? Um, and also, you know, sometimes you need to be a, a, a project um, when the design is not complete um, and you're doing your, 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 your bit of quantity or some material takeoff based on the, on the available design. You know that it's going to be a, a, a design development and it's going to be a design growth. Um, and then you can assess here the, you know, what is the potential increase or decrease in the quantities that you have in, in the baseline and what is the potential impact in the, in, in the end date. And then you can also say the, what is the nature of the work, uh, whether well, it could be longer or shorter lead time for materials. So you have, let's say you have three quotations from suppliers. You don't know which one to use yet. You have one with 10 months, another one with 11, another one 14 months. So you can assess this in, in the schedule to see whether you can actually accommodate the lead time from the different suppliers without making you know, an, a compromise on the, on the, on the end date. So based on that, what, what we did in this project, we, we sat together with all the construction and, and the procurement and engineering team, and, and we did an assessment of the three durations. So we look at the optimistic, and the most likely, uh, and the pessimistic duration. Again, um, I, I think that, you know, this recommended practice for NACE is, is actually pretty good. Uh, it gives you a lot of... Um, uh, I would say background about what you need to do to determine the activity durations in, in, in the schedule. So I, I, I highly recommend that, that you read this recommended practice. So based on that, so what we did in the, in the, in the, in the SRA, we start to test you know, the, the duration of the activity. So as you can see on the screen, um, so what do we say, for example, with the piling work, so we say, well, what, you know, what, what is the potential impact in, in the duration, if we have an increase in the number of piles, or what happened in the production rates that we adopt in the baseline is, is better or is worse. So in the baseline, we say, they, you know, we, we, we made an assessment and say, we, we expect this to be 100 days, but, you know, we, we, we could go, from, you know, from 90 days to 110 days. And the idea is to see, you know, if we have any, any potential increase or decrease in the duration, what is the impact on the, on the end date? 
So um, before I move to duration uncertainty analysis, and do we have any questions so far? We're not having any questions. Ah, yes, we are having okay. one question from Jesse. He said, uh, what software have you used to produce um, those du duration simulations? Look, I have used different software. So I'm, I, I start using Permaster. So, you know, I'm talking about a long, long time ago. Then Permaster was bought by Primavera. It became, you know, Primavera Risk. Um, and then, you know, Primavera Risk is, is sort of like a, out of the market now. Um, I have used, you know, um, Deltic, you know, Acumen Risk. I have been using, you know, Oracle Risk. Um, I have seen, you know, have used Safran before in, in, in an in a oil and gas project back in Europe. Um, look, I, I think most of the tools are, you know, they are, they are pretty good, you know, to do what you need to do. Um, you, you always get a little bit of, you know, attachment to a tool when you get familiar with that. Um, but I think, you know, what is important that you follow, you know, the, the process and, 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 and you understand the input that you put in the SRA. So, and, you know, I always say to a, to a good friend in Italy, I said, well, I can give you a Ferrari, you don't go anywhere. So, and, so I think, you know, the tool is just a tool. Yeah. Okay, so if we don't have any question about you know duration uncertainty so far, so I, I will go to the, the weather risk. So um, then the next step after that it was just to assess the weather. So um, uh, look, I, I, I know that some people decide to put the weather in in in, in the baseline schedule, uh, and they, they you know they just block the working days in the working calendar. Um, my, my preference is really just to, to have the weather impact in, in the SRA rather than blocking the working days in the working calendar. Um, why? Because when, when using the SRA, you can assess not only the normal weather condition, but all, also the after effects of unusual extreme weather. Um, and it also allows us to visualize the level of contingency in the beach schedule for, for weather risk. So, um, so you, you can see here in, you know, in, in the graph, where you know we can see what is the potential impact of historical weather condition on weather sensitive activities so we look at what is the potential impact on activities like you know demolition excavation piling you know during the rainy season what is the impact of heat what is the impact of wind when we're doing you know the heavy lift you know and installation of the of the structure steel on the roof um, and then we can also see you know what is the minimum the most likely and the maximum impact you know for for the activities. And, and the good thing about this is you, you can actually create, you know, different weather calendars. So you can have one, you know, what weather calendar for, for rain, another one for heat, another one for cold. You know, I've been in projects in the Middle East where you also need to do something for a sunstorm because it could have an impact, you know, on the welding activities because they, you know, can contaminate some of the, the activities in the, in the work. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I think that it, it's more transparent and then, you know, uh, you know, of course, you know, every company has their own historical data. Uh, you need to understand whether the, the, the contract or the project allows to claim time and cost compensation for weather event. Um, I have been in projects where, you know, the clients say, I, I, I need a, a dry schedule. So and you get time or, or you get time and cost compensation for weather. So if that's the case, you know, you may not need to include this in, in, in your SRA. Um, otherwise, you know, you, you, need to, you need to have a look at what is the potential impact. Um, you, you can use your internal, you know, um, you know, weather, you know, data that you have, um, or, or you can use, you know, some of the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the website. Um, again, you know, one of the recommended practice from the ACE is, is, is really good about how to plan and, and account for adverse, adverse weather. And, and then these are, you know, some of the recommendations. Uh, let me have a look at some of the questions that I have here before I move into the next step, you know. Uh, what software have you used to produce the duration simulation? I think I answered this already. Do you have a checklist for conditions and circumstances that affect projects? 
Look, um, John, I, I think it, it also depends on what is the stage of the project. Um, if you are in a construction only, I guess, you know, the design risk are not part of the equation. And if you are in, in, in an EPC or a, or a DNC contract, uh, they, they you have bigger risk because you, you need to complete, you know, the design and, and the procurement. Um, and it also depends, you know, on the part of the, you know, the, the location of the project, you know, every project is very unique. Um, I have been working in projects in places like Iraq, where you know you, you have very completely you know different condition that you have from from other places even even in the middle east or you know even projects in you know in, in australia so you, you have different weather conditions or, or you have you know you know you, you can be more affected by you know you know local content um so I, I guess you need to have a look at you know all the different kind of you know risk uh, do you want a checklist look my recommendation have a look at you know, they, they recommend the practice in the ASCE. You have a lot of information you can read through about, you know, some of the, 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 the I would say the factors you need to consider, you know, when you develop the basis of the schedule. And who is responsible for paying weather related delays, contracting, including the contingency for 20 days, but end up in 25 days. Claim does all depending on the type of contract. So, and you have contracts where the clients say you need to include, you know, you know, all the weather allowance. And, and you have, you know, clients where you say, look, you know, you know, if you have any weather delay, you, you know, you, you will get a time and cost compensation, but you need to understand that, you know, you, you need to be able to demonstrate the impact on the critical path. So that's again, going back to the quality of their schedule. So if you're trying to, to get that time, you know, extension of time in, in your schedule of, let's say, five days, but you have, you know, you know the, your, your schedule is not really very robust and have big floats, well, good luck to trying to demonstrate, you know, that you, you get a, a good case to get an extension of time. Um, BOM have issued an alert for the coming three months, which get a higher likelihood of a bot average rainfall. Uh, look, um, it, it, what what you probably need to do, and and, and it's depend on how you qualify your 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 project, and and then we can talk about this, you know, during the case study. So what you try to do is just uh, you need to be a, a little bit careful. You're not going to end up just putting an SRA, you know, an event that has happened, you know, every hundred years. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be competitive. So you you need to be a, a little bit, you know, conscious about that, you know. Uh, I, I remember just bidding for a for a project in Japan, and somebody was asking me about, uh, are we going to account for something for earthquake? And I was like, well, the day that I can tell you when it's going to be an earthquake, you know, I, I think I'm going to be rich. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be just gambling. But, but I, I think the way you need to do is just to to be, you know, you know, use common sense, and and use your commercial, you know, tools, and to say, look. We, we made an allowance in, in the project for, you know, historical weather conditions, something above the normal weather condition, maybe you need to qualify this. So it's all back to, you know, how you are going to treat the risk. But we, we will talk about this, you know, you know in, in the next slide. Uh, let me see, I, I will answer the last question about weather, and then we move to, uh, <laughs> if we need to submit weather included schedule, how do we prepare a program for baseline schedule? when we're doing weather analysis separate in SRA. Again, and, and that's what I mentioned before, Rajesh, and you, you have two options. You can either include your weather in, you know, in, in your baseline calendar. And I know that there are people that they, they just prefer to block, you know, working days in, in, in the calendar. And I say, look, you know, I know that I'm going to lose one day or two days on, on a specific month because of raining. And, and then you use on a specific, you know, calendar for these activities in, in, in your schedule. Um, my preference is, is always to do it in the SRA. I think it's more transparent because then you can also assess not only, you know, one, one number or one specific, you know, impact. You can see what is the minimum impact, the most likely and the maximum impact from, you know, from rain or heat or cold or wind. So, and, so that, that, that's my preference. So I'm, I, I don't know, the, you know, you have some time clients that say, you need to give me a dry schedule. So no, no impact from weather. And then you claim if something happened. Um, so then 
um, we just move to to the next step in, in the SRA input uh, that is basically just the project risk or the discrete risk. So what we're doing here, um, you know, like duration uncertainties and weather risk, we also need to look at the risk event. We're talking about threat, we're talking about opportunities. And in, in this case, you know, in this stadium, so we identify and include, you know, all the risk and opportunities in, 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 in our SRA. Um, we came up with, with a risk register um, with the team. And we, we actually have a few workshops just to, to develop the risk register. And we use a lot of historical data. We use experience. We have, you know, some SMEs involved in the, in the workshop. Um, and then we, we look at what is the probability of the risk occurring and, and, the, and the time and the cost impact. So, um, so this is just a, a summary of the, you know, the, the, the risk register. So, um, and what, what you probably need to have a look is, you know, you know, every company have different process and governance to identify, and assess and quantify project risk. And, uh, you know, you, you have companies where they say, look, um, you know, then part of the governance and, and, and the, the risk, you know, appetite framework that we have in the company, uh, we have zero tolerance for, let's say, you know, contaminated material, or we have zero tolerance for, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know any, any kind of risk. So if that's the case, you, you need to see, you know, how you're going to qualify this. Um, what are the sources for, you know, identification of risk? Look, historical experience, you know, I, I guess, you know, nothing like your own experience, what you're doing, you know, the, 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 the risk identification. Um, if you are working in a project that is already in delivery, in the project risk history, um, you know, whether you, you know, you, you already close, you know, some of the risk from the previous stage. Um, so if you are bidding a job, that is construction only, but you have certain risk from the design because you know that the design hasn't been, you know, properly closed and they still have some design issues to resolve, even though there is a construction only contract. So you know that it's going to be some risk. Um, lesson learned, you know, obviously. Um, interviews, you know, um, you know in, in this case for this project, um, we, we had to, to engage with with some of the experts that we have in the company, you know, um, some SME for for the retractable roof for the stadium. So we, we, we didn't have, you know, all the experience in this sort of roof. Um, insurance and regulatory requirements. So again, as I mentioned before, it, it could be that you have some kind of risk that you, you, you are not allowed to insure. So you need to be sure that you put some allowance, whether it's in the, in the, in the schedule or in the, or in the budget. Um, project risk workshops, obviously. Um, so this is the best, the best way to collect all the risk. And, and again, you know, many others, so you have company, they have, you know, a standard checklist and they just go through the checklist for, you know, for different kind of projects. Um, again, <clears throat> um, you know, I would recommend that you, you have a look at the, you know, the, the recommended practice for risk assessment. Um, you keep you pretty good, um, explanation about the process and, and how you can develop your, your risk register. So do we have any comment or question at this point? We're not having any question. <clears throat> That's good. <clears throat> so it means that everybody understand what I say or just, you know, people are just lost or getting boring about the topic. So let's say, let's, let's go to the next. Um, so then um, we, we go to what we have in the SRA is the project risk matrix. Um, so when, when you build the SRA model, you, you also need to look at the risk matrix. So every contractor have, you know, different, you know, level of risk um, acceptance. Um, you know, the B team in, in our case for this project, we, we define, you know, how we want to score the, the, the risk when we run the, the SRA uh, and the interaction between the probability and the impact. Um, what we use, we, we use this based on the, the governance that we have in, in our project and the, and the level of control. So we say, look, you know, we, we have some kind of, you know, risk matrix that we use depending on the size of the project or depending on the location of the project. And, and that's what we use for, for every, you know, every project that is falling into this, this sort of category. Um, 
So then the next step, I guess, is really just to, we have all the ingredients, so we just put everything in the mixer, and then we see what is the, the result of the SRA. So, <clears throat> when, when we're building the, the, the shell risk analysis, I, I think that um, we, we need to do what is called, you know, building the SRA. Um, so once the project race and the weather race and everything is in the race register, the next step is really just for us to map the risk with the activities in, in, in the schedule. So as you can see on the screen, so we say, well, look, we, we have, you know, one of the risks for us is, you know, limited access impacting, you know, the, the trucking productivity. Uh, and then we just map the risk to the activities that we think that it could have an impact. So we say, well, the demolition of the existing structure because it's an impact with all the trucks going in and out of the side, with, with the earthwork, again, it's just because the truck, and, and the roof structure, because we know that we have issues with the delivery of materials to the side. Um, and then, you know, we, we just look at, you know, what is the potential time impact from this risk to these activities. Now, something that is very important for you guys to understand is, is you need to have a very good understanding on how the duration of the beach schedule were developed. So why I say that? If you already have in your schedule, you know, a duration that is taking into account that you have a difficult access to the site, you need to be careful that you don't put this again in the SRA or you're going to not wait a contingency over contingency. Okay, so that, that's something that, you know, that's what I always prefer that the person who actually build the SRA is the person who actually build the, the bid, the, the baseline schedule, because that's the person that really understand the, the basis of the schedule and, and how the duration were developed. Okay, so and then the next step is really just to run the, the model. And, and we, we just get an output. So, so when, when, when you run an SRA, you know, people are going to be talking about risk exposure, confidence level, P date, risk driver, contribution, contingency. So that's sort of like, a, this, you know, the terminology that you use, you know, when you're running an SRA. Or somebody say, what is the risk exposure that we have, you know, from the SRA? Or what is the confidence level that we have that we're going to meet this target? Or what is the proposed P date for our project? Um, so, but let, let's see how, how we use this information from the SRA to answer some of the questions that we have from, from our management in this project. So, if you go back again to, you know, the questions that we have at the beginning when we were bidding this job. So, the, 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 the senior management came to us and they said, what is the probability that we can meet the contractual date? So, what we need to look at in the SRA is, is the risk exposure and the confidence level. And we will see this, you know, on the next slide. So what is the best case? What is the most likely? What is the worst case? So again, we're looking at P dates. What is the probability date that we have for these different scenarios? And then the, the managers, you know, the management also asks, which risk had the biggest contribution to potential delays? So we're just looking at the risk drivers and we look at the contribution, okay? So, and, and that's how you actually link in the, the information that is coming from the SRA with these, you know, typical questions that you get from your management when you're bidding a job or when you're putting a business case or, or even when you're doing a project and you're doing an SRA in the middle of the project because you, you want to recheck, you know, your forecast. You know, what is the chance that we're going to finish on time? What is the best case? What is the worst case? And, and what are the biggest risks that we have that it could have an impact in the project? So that, I guess it's just, you know, you know, typical question that we get in any project. And so then when we're doing this, um, we just get in the SRA what we call the different P values and the, and the race drivers, and then let's have a look. So and what we see here is the, the first run of the SRA. Um, this is what we call the the pre-mitigated or the no-mitigation scenario. Um, if you remember um, the contractual date said that it had to finish on 2020. Um, and when you see the SRA is actually telling you that this is just a P10. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, 
so what he said, this is the best case. So best case is really just the shortest schedule that we can have. And it's just telling you that it's a P10. So what, what is the meaning of P10? So what it's telling you, it is a 10% probability that you can meet the target, okay? So what happened is, you know, the, you know, our company decided that it was just, you know, you know, way too low or it was below the level of, you know, governance that we have in the organization. And they say, no, you, you need to look at different options just to, to increase the probability to meet the date. And, and then if you, if you have a look at the graph that we have on the right side, um, or what we call the schedule contribution, we see that the biggest risk is to the unforeseen ground conditions. Then we have the complex design of the roof. We had the limited space on site to pre-assemble the, the steel frame roof. And, and then you can see, you know, impact on of wind and we have a spill drawings for the ground service not available. So the good thing about doing this is that you can actually see where the delays are coming from and, and how you link the activities with, with your risk register. So we just go to the next step. Um, you know, the team had to look at the ways that they can, you know, they can increase the probability to meet the, the target. Uh, or or we, we had to propose a different date from the one that we got in the proposal. So, you know, the, you know, our, you know, stakeholders, they say, no, it's too risky. P10, you know, we're, we're not willing to take the risk to go ahead with a proposal like this. And we need to do something or, or, or we, we just need to propose a new date. So that's when we move to, to the next step is just to do the, 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 the risk treatment. So what we need to do to ensure that we can meet the date. So, um, so what we have here, you know, in very simple way is, you know, what, what we're going to do. So the, the, the first step is just look, the probability of meeting the contract date is, is way below the acceptance level of risk for the, the, the company. Um, so we need to evaluate. So, the, so what we did, we, we just look at, you know, different risk response to ensure that the, the unacceptable risks were, were treated. Um, we select, you know, different options. And we also look at, you know, the, the top 10 risks. So we have a, you know, very comprehensive, you know, risk register. I can't remember, I think there were more like a hundred risks. And, and, and it was really just, you know, the argument about you, you can actually treat every single risk. We need to focus on the, on the top 10 risks that have, you know, an impact in, in the schedule. Um, and then, you know, what we did, you know, we identify what we call the secondary risk that may arise from the risk response. So if we said like, we're going to change, you know, you know, one of the suppliers to another supplier because they have a shorter, you know, um, you know lead time. So the, 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 the secondary risk is how we work with this supply before, and if not, what are we going to do to ensure that we can deliver on time? So, and, and then, you know, we, we just update the SRA model based on the, on the risk response or the risk mitigation actions. And, and, and again, we just run, you know, the, the, the SRA again. And what you see here is, you know, the different options that we have. Um, in some cases, we look at, you know, what we can do to avoid the risk. Um, you know, for example, you know, part of the design of the original design of the roof was redesigned during the, during the proposal. So we just came up with, with an improved constructability. Um, and we put this as part of the B2 mission. So we said, look, we're proposing something um, a little bit different and not 100% changing the design, but I think that something is going to de-risk the schedule. So we're trying to avoid the risk. And uh, we reduce um, some of the risk. So trying to mitigate the, the risk, um, we either reduce the probability or we reduce the impact. And, uh, you know, for example, you know, we, we have an early engagement of the roof supplier during the bid. So we, we have a, you know, sort of like a, like a pre-agreement with the, with the roof supplier. And we say, look, you know, you, you need to, you know, help me to, you know, to come up with, with a better construction methodology. If you think that, you know, that, that, you know, that's the better way to do it. If we win the job, you win the job. And um, we also look at transfer some of the risk um, to a competent third party. 
um, you know, sometimes you have an insurance, you know, you can say, well, this is an insure event, I can transfer this to an insurance. That's not my preference because um, this is either, even though this is a safety net, so if every project team think that they can tap into an insurance, so then the insurance for your organization is going to be way, you know, over the roof. So um, so I think that what you need to do is just probably just to look at ways to, to probably to qualify some of the risk, you know, if it's possible, um, or, or, or cap. So, and, you know, in this case, what we did in this project, we, we qualify, you know, you know, something like the unforeseen grant conditions. So we say to the client, look, um, there is no sufficient information from the sign investigation. Um, so, you know, we, we can, we are happy to take, you know, up to five days of, you know, impact in the, in the project, but no more than that, more than five days, you know, we would like to get a time and cost compensation. So we actually qualify this, you know, as part of our proposal. And, and then, you know, you have some risk that, you know, they have no option, but you, you, you probably need to accept that risk, you know? So if you say that you are working in a place that you have a, let's say a shortage of resources, well, you, you know, you have a shortage of resources and you need to accept that because you need to comply with the local content. But that, that's what you need to do. You just need to, you need to plan the job just around this sort of risk. So, and, and this is just sort of like a summary of what we did. Um, so, you know, uh, we just look at, you know, what we can do, you know, uh, whether we can avoid, whether we can transfer, whether we can reduce. Uh, we have our risk breakdown structures, which was based on what we use in the in the in the in the company, and and you know I think something that is very critical is just that you identify who is going to be the risk owner, to to ensure that the, the mitigation action is, is put in place during the delivery phase. So then you know we we ran the the SRA again, and and you can see now that. You know, we we actually moved to uh, P50. So we say, look, now you know the you know the date that they are expecting, which is just around you know the first week of January, is actually around a P70. Um, but we were targeting to finish before the Christmas break because we didn't want to move you know the, any contract or subcontractor back to the side after the Christmas break. We thought it, it would be you know not, not efficient. So we target just to finish this, you know, in the middle of December, 2019. Um, and that was, you know, in our proposal. So you can see now in, 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 the, in, the, in the schedule contribution or, or the risk contribution, you know, the, the, you know, the top risk is now the impact of wind. So I, I guess, you know, you, you, there is nothing you can do about it. You, you need to make an allowance in the schedule for, for, for weather. And we just put this in, in, in the proposal. Um, the impact of rainfall, the same, and access constraint. So look, I think that we had to live with the access constraint. So we, we just put an, an extra allowance in the schedule and the construction of the new road. Look, it's nothing you can do about it. You just need to, to, to coordinate, you know, the, the work with what happened on site. The limited space on site, again, you know, we, we had the constraint with, with the access uh, and, this, and, the, and the footprint that we have. And, and that's what, you know, we end up. So we just go to the point where we say there is nothing more that we can do. We, we just need to, to go ahead with what we have. So, and, and then the next step for us was just to, well, you know, what is going to be the, the P day that we're going to propose. So if you see here, so we say, look, what is the probability to, to meet the contractual date? We say that it's more than P50 after mitigation. Uh, which one are the, the, the biggest risks that we have? The, you know, again, we talk about the weather, access constraint, construction of the new road, and the limited space on site. So what well, you can see, you know, some of the risks are, you know, risks that there is, you know, this, there is no further, you know, way that we can, you know, mitigate the risk. The best case is in, in October, you know, the worst case is in February, and, and we decide just to go with a P50, you know, mid-December, just to avoid the Christmas break. Then, you know, what we did, the next step is really just to what we call the, the, the risk adjust schedule. So, and so you can see here. Um, so we, we review the durations that we have in the baseline to, to propose a P50 duration. Um, 
Look at this, and we have in the baseline duration, so if we take, you know, something like, uh, I don't know, let's have a look at um, 40 days that we have in mobilization, we look at the P50, we say 37 days. So in this case, we have actually some, uh, some opportunities to reduce the, the duration, which is good because then you have more time to other activities like utility relocation, that we have 60 days on the baseline, and we say that the P50 duration should be actually just in the range of 86 days. And then what you can see, we, we just adjust the duration for every activity in the program um, to produce the P50 you know, schedule that it was, the, what we put in the proposal. So um, we just go to conclusions and recommendation. Um, again, uh, I think that using you know, a quantitative schedule risk analysis, it, it drive you know, the, the B team to identify project risk and understand the potential impact to, to the bid schedule and, and the project estimate. So it's, it's actually you know, better to do this than just come up with, well, we always use 10% or we always use 50%. Um, using quantitative scheduling risk analysis provide you know meaningful information to the team um, and and the business to drive better decisions. So uh, so as you can see, we we look at you know, what we need to do to drive some some of these uh, these risk and how we can handle that. Um, and again, using the SRA promotes a more consistent and transparent process to to prepare risk response. And, and what is the, 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 the adequate contingency aligned with the organization acceptable level of risk? So I guess it's really just to minimize the optimism and bias and, you know, and, and to ensure that we have some governance in, in place. So I think that's it oh. from the case study. So I think I, I will go to have a look at, you know, some of the questions that we have here. Alberto, uh, uh -huh. I think, that's the end of the presentation, right? So yes. before going through a couple of questions that I'm having in the book chat, yep. can we launch the poll to just to get a feedback from our attendees? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm going to launch one of um, four questions, please. I would like to get insights from you and this is to get an um, idea how to improve our next webinars. Yeah, you must be seeing in your screen four questions. Great. I think we are we're okay. We're having 81% already answered the poll. I'm gonna finish the poll now, and we were going to uh, read the questions out. Okay. One of the questions here from Louis is: um, Did you have good interaction with your client in developing the risk register? Well, I guess it, it, it all depends on, you know, what is the, you know, the, the, the bid process with the client, you know, there, there are some clients that they are, they are okay to, to have a, an, an open conversation about some of the risk. 
And some clients say that in any question, it had to be, you know, open and it had to be shared with all the all the bidders. So if that's the case, well, it's really your, your strategy, whether you want to, to share this with your competitors, you know, during the bid or, 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 or just, just make an allowance or, or just qualify. Um, there is a lot of clients that you see that they are moving more into an ECI or the early contractor involvement, which I think is, is pretty good because um, it, it allows you to, to actually go through some of the risk with the client and it helps you to develop a, you know, a, a, a risk register that is, that is actually with, you know, with the two different point of views. Um, again, depending on the type of contract, um, there is clients that are moving more into the two stages contract where you know you have you know an early you know a stage of the project where you're doing part of the design and, and then you can revisit the, the schedule and the budget at the end of the first stage before moving to the delivery phase. Uh, look, I, I think you know ideally you know you, you can have this open conversation with the client so the uh, I like the projects where you are in an alliance with the client because you know the, you get pretty good understanding of some of the risk because the client you know usually have been involved in the project for many years before you actually get involved during the delivery phase. Cool. And we are having the next question from Colleen. Mm -hmm. What is the best approach, critical chain method or critical path method for bid submission? I think that's a general question. Okay, uh, look, um, uh, I, I like, if, if you're going to run an SRA, I would say that the critical path method is the best way to go. And the critical change, what I have seen before, is, is more driven by when you have limited resources and, and then you want to see, you know, what is, the, what is the additional duration that you need to put in your program based on, you know, resources availability. Um, Again, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, whether resource availability is, is just one of the biggest, you know, constraint in, in your project. But, um, but again, you know, I, I think critical path for me is, is, is the best option to go. Um, but, you know, if, if you have a linear, you know, schedule, you know, something like a pipeline or you have an overhead line or, you know, something that, you know, that is one activity after the other one, you know, the, the critical chain method is probably not a bad idea to, to have a look, but again, I just prefer the critical path if you're running an SRA. Correct. Um, we're not having more questions. I have one question if you don't mind to answer. Yeah. Is, uh, are we currently taking into account this COVID and pandemic situation to run this SRA? Is there any procedure that is being implemented lately to like develop this kind of analysis? Mm. Yes and no. So we have, you know, have been in projects and have been having this conversation with, with colleagues in, in Europe and, and, and in the US where you have projects that they say, look, um, you need to be the job, you know, as business as usual. And, and then, you know, any impact from COVID-19, we, we just open the book and we have a look at this with you, client. Um, we have clients that say you need to account for COVID-19, you know, until June next year. And what we have seen is that you need to have a look at what is the potential impact in productivity. You know, there, there are some contractors that say that the productivity had dropped in about 20% because of the, the COVID-19 impacting, you know, you know, you know, social distance on site. It, it also depends on type of project. So, and uh, if you're in a project that is more like a horizontal project, you know, you're building a, you know, a refinery or a chemical plant, I guess the impact is probably less than if you are in a vertical construction like a residential tower because, you know, you, you probably need to use the hoist, you need to use, you know, um, getting materials and labor on the, you know, on the, on the hoist, you know, to get to the different levels. So uh, this is going to have a, you know, a big impact in your productivity. Um, the, you know, something that you also need to have a look is, you know, and, and uh, having have been having this conversation with other friends about, you know, what is the potential impact of COVID-19 on, you know, on the subcontractors and the suppliers. So what if, you know, one of the subcontractors get into bankruptcy, you know, during the delivery? Um, and, the, and that's, you know, a, a big question, you know, what are you going to do with that, you know? Uh, so, and, and, and again, you know, it, it depends on the client, you know, how you, you can assess this. What I have done is that I, I just look at the potential impact on productivity 
at least you know you know during the next six months and and then you know we can take it from there okay good uh, we're having one question from marcus are the same scenario analysis done uh for cost yes um for this project we we actually ran and integrate you know cost and time risk analysis i couldn't show the cost because it's a little bit confidential and i actually had to change some of the dates of the project so this project was actually you know deliver maybe like a couple of years earlier um but you know you you run the, the time and cost scenario together why are you doing this because you also need to look at well you know do you prefer to increase the project in six weeks uh what is impacting your overhead you know what is the prolongation cost for your indirects versus spending you know two million dollars to mitigate the risk so you, you need to make this this kind of decision marcus what, what is the best for you um and and then you, you have the tools you know with you know with different risk software to run you know the the, the sra and the cra and to see what is the impact with and without the cost of the mitigation actions and, and then you can look at, you know, what is the, the prolongation cost that you have. So it is not only the indirects, but it's also, you know, you have projects that you have, you know, heavy penalties for late delivery. That's also you need to put it to account in your, in your model. Okay, good. And do, do you have one more slide, I think, uh, Alberto? This one, yeah. So, uh, and, yeah. so I, I, again, it's it. just a list of, you know, recommend the practice that I use very often. So I'm, I've been a, a member of the ACE for uh, 20 years now. So I'm, 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 you know, I always like to go back and have a look at some of these recommended practice. These recommended practice usually get re revised, you know, you know, sometime and it's time to try to be more, I would say, relevant to, you know, the, the, the industry and the technology. Um, yes, we're having a couple of more questions. Is there any, is there a quick way to convert in back the mitigated um, schedule risk analysis back to P6 for submission? Yes, and I can see who is asking this because we went through this painful process before in my proposal, Chris. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I actually spoke with the software that, that we use and, and the next release you're going to be able to export different P scenarios back to P6 automatically. So the answer is yes, yes. You, you, you can actually just, you know, go into your SRA and say, I want to export the P70 or the P75 back to P6, and then you will get, you know, your, your, your P75, you know, you know, baseline. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, there's another question from Marcus. Uh, how do you manage and control the risks along the project? Look, um, if you're talking about SRA, so um, my recommendation is, you know, I'm probably just running an SRA, you know, on, on a regular basis. Um, there are some companies that they say, well, we're going to run an SRA on a quarterly basis for large projects. And there are companies say, we just run an SRA, you know, you know every month. And I, I work with, you know, companies where we run an SRA depending on different gates that we have in the project. So we say, you know, when we complete, you know, the, you know, the 30% model review and we freeze the layout, we, we need to rerun an SRA. When we place all the purchase order for the lonely items, we need to rerun an SRA. And why are we doing this? Because the risk register is like your critical path. So it's just changing and you need to update this. So let's say that you already complete, you know, all the site preparation, you know, all the risks that you have related to unforeseen ground conditions or relocation of utilities, they should be retired. And then you need to look at what are the risks that you have remaining or whether you have new risk in, in your project. So that's something you, you need to keep, you know, managing the risk, you know, all the way along, you know, the project until completion. And that's also part of your, your contingency market. So, um, so let's say you have, I don't know, 15 or 20% contingency in, in your schedule. You know, when you start to progress your project, you, you need to start to think at some point about, you know, whether you're going to release the contingency from the time and cost point of view. Uh, and then, you know, so you, you don't want to be in a project where, 
you know, you, you have been working for three years in the project, you are just, you know, few weeks before you complete the project and you still have, you know, three months of, you know, contingency on the back, you know, so, so you, that's something you need to have a look at how you manage your contingency also through the different stages of the project. Okay, and I think we covered all the questions. Um, okay, Paul, if you have any comment, just to finalize our presentation, our webinar. Well, th thank you very much, Alberto, for, for presenting. That's absolutely fabulous. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Frank, for uh, organizing this. I certainly don't have any questions. Um, I'm just about to learn how the ASTA Power Project uh, Risk Module works, which will which is one of my one of the things I'm going to do tomorrow, which uh, which I'm interested in doing. So uh, yeah, uh, if uh, nobody's got any more questions for uh, for Alberto, I suggest we make it an open mic session. If anybody's got any questions or want to talk to anybody, uh, that would be great. Yeah, just as a reminder, I'm stopping the recording, but then we can start talking and uh, chatting after this uh, with our open mic. It's probably best if you turn Yeah, you're on mute, Paul. Paul, you got muted. Oh, Something sorry. Happened. Well, I was going to say, if you want to speak, I suggest you leave your mic muted unless you want to speak and then we can see who wants to speak. So. I haven't got anything else to say, so I'll mute my. Anybody wants to talk, please unmute your mic. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed our webinar of tonight, and we'll see you in the next webinar.